having a, an iguana over some years. And um, yeah, um, so um, well, let me. Um, uh, okay, I'm sorry, uh, I lost connection here. Um, so yeah, um, uh, I've always been interested in, in uh, reptiles and I had an iguana and so I needed to give that away. And um, so at some point, um, I guess it was after listening a podcast of uh, Marty with um, the guy from the, from the Temple of Awakening Divinity. Um, they were talking about these toads and uh, actually I heard about the toads when I was 19 first time and a friend of mine had a reptile shop and so he had these toads but the des these days you know they were always wild and um, at the time when I heard first about them again uh, which was shortly after I experienced the uh, first time DMT smoke which is like 10 years ago now. Um, I had bumped into the toads, so what is that, you know, it's, and then it's DMT and some toads, you know, but uh, at the end, we all, we all know it's 5-MeO-DMT, which is a totally different drug experience than NMDMT. Uh, it's not that NMDMT can, can offer you, um, can't offer you, because many people say, like, uh, NMDMT is, like, not powerful enough. Uh, the point is, like uh, Celsius said, Paracelsius said, it's like the... Um, the dose makes the um, makes the poison, yeah. And so it's with drugs, the dose makes the experience. So if you if you vape uh, fifty to sixty milligrams of NNDMT, you are experiencing the very same thing as you experience with um, with the twelve or thirty milligram or five milligram DMT. So um, I learned that these toads have this uh, capacity to um, produce the 5 meo DMT in their glands. And um, I got very interested in it because I was interested in the animal itself. So uh, at that time, which is like nine years ago, um, there were only wild toads present on the, on the market um, here. So um, I put it on ice and uh, it popped up later, um, like two years later. And I was able to obtain um, German bred toads. So there's a, a breeder in Germany and also one in Russia um, at least six years, seven years ago, there were one. Um, there were two. And um, so I was, I was lucky to get um, four toads and then another uh, seven. And actually in the process, um, two of the, of the first uh, toads died. Um, for unknown reason, they, they came from the Frankfurt Zoo and uh, it was clear, you know, how they've been raised. They were already one year old. Don't want to bore anyone. It's just so I got my hands on the toad. Um, many people have never seen such a toad and yet they have had an experience with the secretion of those toads where you then start to question yourself, you know, where's the secretion coming from? How is it harvested? How are these toads treated in the in the process? What's all behind that? So, uh, in my case, I can always wholeheartedly say that I'm the one caring for these animals. I am the one who is who. Yeah, well, to need to go down on them and and milk the secretion out of their glands, and I know how they can get infections if you don't properly do it, and I know how to treat them if they have an infection, and all these things I can see meanwhile, and I'm overall seeing that these toads they don't like it it's just like you know i love to see uh, i love to use the, the, the image like um if you would be approached by a 10 times higher um toad wanting to milk your acne how would you like this <laughs> and when you and when you take this into consideration you got to start asking yourself how spiritual is your experience if there's another being suffering for exactly that. So it's all love, you know, the toads are, the toads are not excluded, they're not lesser or lower than us. So you gotta start to ask the question, is it really needed to use toads? Luckily, we just mentioned that here in the Netherlands, it's legal to obtain 5-MeO-DMT lab-made product. So since the original substance is a blueprint from God directly, like nature, it's 5-MeO, the natural substance. So is there really a difference between um, making that, you know, synthesizing that in a laboratory or synthesizing it in a, in a um, toad, in a living animal? So I come to the conclusion and 
I'm, I don't know where I'm going here, you know, I'm just, it's flowing, yeah, so I come to the conclusion that this is pretty much um, the same experience you gain, you get from the, they call it synthetic, I call it synthesized, because I believe that a synthetic drug, for me, you know, I'm totally wrong, I guess, uh, for me, is a synthetic drug would be like LSD, something which is man-made, which is processed through a human brain and not directly coming from the source itself. So I call it synthesized. And as a matter of fact, those um, laboratories, they can't use in the process the cleanliness I can have in my small lab here. So what I do is I take these free base crystals and I clean them and I recrystallize them over three, four days into, into salt grain size like 5-MeO DMT crystals, which makes them very, very close to 100% pure. So then you have, again, energy added into the whole thing of the growing process of the crystal, like um, crystals are containing information. This is something, you know, on my beloved water, people who know me go, you know that I'm crazy for this water. You see this water crystal here, it's all containing the information of the water in that, and it shows itself in the crystalline structure. So the, the purer, the more solid, the bigger a crystal grows, the more information it contains. I've been starting a, a big thread with this for an ND DMT crystal growing 10 years ago on the Nexus, the DMT Nexus. And it was going all and about uh, because the people, you know, it's, it's like the drug is the drug is the drug. But um, interestingly, if you smoke different sized crystals, different shaped crystals, you would enter up in a different space. It could very well be all the mind, you know. Uh, on the other hand, if a certain dose is reached, um, there's no mind left, like you enter into a space which is just like, where you come back, it's a totally outcome. So, all that being said, um, my, my wholehearted um, wish for the future would be that you consider not to do the drug if it's coming from a natural source. Specifically, if you don't know the source, if you have a friend taking care for the toads and he's brave enough and well, let's say, you know, I don't know, it, my toads don't like it. I can only say the toads don't like it. So for me personally, there's no way I will ever use this uh, secretion anymore. At the moment, I'm in a transition phase, so I have some leftovers, but guess what? 99% of my of my clients they go for the secretion uh, they go for the syn for the synthesized version for the crystalline version when they seen what I grow out of the impure stuff I buy um, how pure and how lovely then they see the energy flowing into that and then they just decide like save the toads and after the session they meet the toads that uh, at my place and um, they see like what beautiful animals there are and they're just you know there's no point in harming them um at all so coming back to the initial um how it all started for me and how i came about that what is five me dmt and what it does and i started uh to work with psilocybin, like with mushrooms enhanced through an moi um and those mushrooms get very very powerful like it's the dose makes the poison again um if you have a very high dose mushrooms, like psilocin is enhanced five times or up to five times from my experience through the hamaline, um, you're getting into a whole different realm of experience. It's like you become the experience. It's not there is a person, a me, what typically is called ego. I avoid this word because it's negatively attached so much. I love the mind. I, you know, the human mind is a very beautiful gift. And, and being grateful for that is the starting point into a, a very sacred experience, regardless of the drug. Um, so when you have a very powerful dose of mushrooms, either you take them you take plain, uh, Kilindi E is also talking about this, like high dose psilocin, um, or you take it, you approach that uh, with an MPOI, um, you're in for a very powerful experience. And, um, that powerful experience leads you to a place where the one person having an experience is vanishing into the experience and you become the experience. 
As a matter of fact, in that state, there's not much recollection of what is happening. With the mushrooms, you have an, an in and out experience of two, three hours peak. With the 5-MeO, it's more like you smoke it, you enter the space of nothingness, and then you come back and you remember the entry point and the exit point. So um, the thing is that, yeah, with, uh, just let me finish up. Um, with with 5 meo DMT, you have it easily accessible because you're uh, able to vaporize the drug. Uh, whereas uh, a mushroom experience just takes seven, eight, nine hours with uh, enhancement through the MAOI. And uh, I personally believe um, 5 MEO is a very powerful drug, is a very powerful tool um, to gain such an experience. But from my experience with screening people very properly in these days, I can see it's not for everyone. And even those people who have very positive experience, if they go back into that experience through meditation or um, through the music that's being played and all this, in the week following that, um, there can be coming flashbacks up, which can be as severe as a panic attack. So it's a very powerful drug, yet it needs to be treated with absolute caution. And it's something where I personally believe the easy peasy half an hour session thing, which is going on for some years, is something which needs to be, which needs to stop. I personally believe, um, because it's way too too dangerous. There was a um, um, a center last year, um, or what was it? This year, I can't remember, uh, which was shut down in Zealand, and um, which there was also. Uh, it's not clear what was all involved, but they were using like seven psychedelic drugs in two days. And, and this is something, you know, I can go on like this. Yes, there's a lot of abuse taking place, if you ask me. And there's a lot of drug addiction taking place in the, in the psychedelic um, communities where the excuse of it's medicine, you know, I need healing. You're never healed because you're perfect. So guess what? You know, all healing running after healing is the carrot in front of your nose, which you will never reach. So just an ex excuse, if you ask me, you know, I'm not saying it hasn't medicinal purposes, but, um, well, looking at it sharply, if you go repeatedly every two, three weeks to an ayahuasca session, there's something odd there, if you ask me. I'm, I'm, I'm the guy who's all about be human. It's all about, like, you're in this human experience why not embrace it why not live it broadly why not be human this is your gift this is gifted to you and you're we are all god you know anyway it doesn't matter it doesn't effing matter it just doesn't really matter so when it doesn't matter why not embrace it why not be grateful why not have joy and passion with it and share and um I'm done. <laughs> okay, so the, okay. thank you very much. For listening. I, I don't I come back. Oh. Yeah, thank you very much. For <laughs> thank you, Ollie, very much for that really interesting perspective. Uh, Malin, I know that you have another appointment, so you're welcome to drop off the call if you want, and we will uh, talk more on Saturday. Yeah, no, I'm fine for another 15 minutes, so I'll just sit in and... Yeah, hang around, but any time you want to drop off, you're welcome to. Uh, Ollie, you're welcome to hang around or you're welcome to come, leave the call if you want. Uh, I'm no, going to move I, to... I want to hear what's next. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we've got Julian, I think, coming up next. I'm going to save... Ma Martin, we're saving the best till last. So I hope you can be a little bit patient. <laughs> <laughs> so, Julian, um, we did an interview uh, oh, about a couple of years ago now in Berlin together. Mm -hmm. And... During that interview, we talked a little bit about the 5MEO experience, and you told me that you and your lovely partner, Nikki, had uh, done some writings about that. Um, so perhaps you can tell us your story of how you came to discover 5MEO and how you've come to use it, uh, and, uh, and, and maybe uh, also your perspective on synthetic versus, uh, or synthesized, sorry, Ollie, uh, synthesized <laughs> <laughs> versus... Uh, uh, natural, natural secretion. Yes. Well, thanks, Rudy. Thanks, everyone. I'm really um, pleased to be part of this uh, event. Um, I guess my experience with 5MO starts about a decade ago. Uh, so I come into this story uh, as uh, an esoteric practitioner, as an occultist, as a magician, you know, those kinds of things. So I've got a background in kind of like Wicca and ceremonial magic and so on. 
and then working with various kind of, uh, for want of better terms, indigenous entheogenic uh, cultures and traditions. So about 10 years ago, I encountered 5-MeO-DMT as a synthetic material uh, through a series of those kind of synchronistic and delightful incidents. Uh, it came into my possession as Nikki Weird and I were in the process of writing a book about a thing called Baphomet. So Baphomet is this kind of hybridized deity uh, spirit that appears in the style of magic known as chaos magic, which is a very highly postmodern style of magic that emerged in Europe in the latter part of the 20th century. So as we were doing this work, we were looking for uh, a sacrament of a material to use to access the states of uh, awareness that we were interested in. And um, so we came across the 5-MEO. Uh, I had access, obviously, to things like Irrawid and various other resources at the time, but no other experience of using the material. And so various misadventures and excitements later, we, just, we, we found uh, a, a kind of a successful way for us as a, uh, as a couple and as an uh, affinity group to use this material um, in a kind of sacramental ritual that, that, to cut a long story short, basically looks like taking, uh, engaging with the four elements, so engaging with the smell of soil for the earth, uh, with the smell of plants for the air, with water, uh, and then with honey, the taste of that to represent fire, and then taking collectively uh, the five MEO and doing that in a kind of ceremonial uh, setting. So that was the kind of background that, that I had and the experiences I've, I've had with um, that medicine have kind of flowed from that. So I've had the opportunity to work in a variety of, in a variety of kind of groups of people, facilitating sessions, and obviously my own um, individual work and, and work with other um, groups of uh, esoteric practitioners. Um, I think that it's a fascinating material. I would say that um, the privileging of any number of any one psychedelic drug above another, I think kind of for me misses a little bit the point, which is that it's horses for courses. Different people at different points in their lives respond in different ways to different substances. Different dosages are sometimes useful. Low dosages can be beneficial when you're learning to embrace and interact with a new spirit. When you first go around to somebody's house, you probably sit politely and listen to them talk. You don't rush up and give them a big kiss with tongues. So whilst a high dose experience may be valuable, sometimes it's actually nice to kind of shake someone by the hand, lead yourself in. And partly because of the short duration um, that, that Oliver was, that, and other people have spoken about with 5-MEO, it's really kind of useful from that perspective. Um, equally, the short duration can mean that um, if the substance is being smoked or injected, that um, the short duration of those kinds of experiences tends to mean that uh, there is that flash moment, whatever that is, depending on the dosage level. And sometimes it can be difficult and even traumatic to bring those things back into everyday waking consciousness. So I think we have to think about intelligent dosing rather than heroic dosing. Um, and that includes sometimes periods of abstinence, periods of microdosing, and exploring, exploring these different psychedelics, which are kind of for me, different spirits, different um, uh, styles, and rather like different forms of cookery. You know, I love a good uh, traditional English uh, curry, but uh, I also like Italian food and, uh, and, and, and so on. So having a diversity of material uh, spirits to work with is really important. And in that diversity, I think you have to think about where does this stuff come from? If you can produce the material yourself or your, your immediate community can do that, then that's great. You have to think about um, the impact that whatever the substance is, is having on the ecology, whether that's how long it takes the Banisteriopsis uh, vine to grow, or whether or not it's how the mushrooms are being harvested and whether that's being done well, if it's in a, uh, an outdoor uh, setting, whether it's the 5-MEO, whether it's taken from a toad or taken from a, a Chinese laboratory. So we have to really kind of think about these things and be mindful of those things. There's probably no gold standard answer uh, but it's about having an engagement with the fact that we're dealing with, if you like, spiritual matters. And like alchemists, we also have to deal with the very material leaden reality of these are products that can be bought and sold in a variety of different ways. And there's lots of control and issues associated with those. I don't know. I don't really see much of a separation in a way between uh, synthetic or synthesized and organic. Firstly, we know that there are examples of substances that have been found or, or created initially in laboratories and subsequently found in nature. There are plenty of plants and indeed probably animals out there that we haven't assayed and we haven't relationships with. So there may well be other substances uh, which we only know it's so far in laboratory environments, which might subsequently be found in the biology of our planet. Uh, I think that um, we have to, within 
the synthetic or artificial, man-made and natural, we have to, for me, problematize the whole idea that, about this separation. So like the separation between mind and body or between matter and, and spirit. You know, I've met people like um, Shulgin. He looked to me like a piece of biology. And therefore, one might argue that the things he creates and he created in his alchemist's laboratory were pieces or other outputs of a very specialized form of biology, which is based primarily on the human ability to make and use fire. So uh, I think that it's about having an intelligent engagement with these substances in terms of the dosage, in terms of where we take them from and in terms of how we use them. And that's that's it for me. Favimo, I have to say, is one of my personal favorites, Yeah, mm -hmm. a, a, along with things like uh, LSD, which whilst I take the point that it doesn't quite occur in nature, there are probably uh, perhaps lost organic ways of realizing this material as was done perhaps in Eleusis, some nice archeological evidence to support the Eleusinian mysteries, LSD idea that I think was in an uh, from a find in Spain uh, a couple of years ago, uh, looking at the possibility that there was some cunning way of taking the ergot and, and processing it into a, a lysergamide type material. So the difference between natural and artificial is very, very much open to question. And something that is artificial uh, can also have its own issues, its carbon footprint, the uh, environment in which it's being produced, all of the technology that has to add up to its production. But it's about trying to find substances where as you take that substance, you can have a good feeling as far as is possible that you are engaging in an experience that's kind of honorable and has good heart in it. Yeah, because that's probably going to seed a really good journey, whether that journey is a low dose going into nature and walking around journey, whether that's like some kind of high dose reset experience that you want to do to have that sense that the medicine is good medicine is really important. OK, that's great. We've just lost Martin. I hope oh, you didn't I... get too bored. Um, I didn't, I didn't so... do nothing. <laughs> oh, he's coming that... back. Hi, Martin. We lost you for a second. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. So, Jim, thank you so much for that, Julian. You are such a compelling speaker. It's always a pleasure to to talk to you. Um, we are a little bit constrained with time, but uh, thank you for joining us on this Thank You Plant Medicine Day and for telling your story and uh, for destigmatizing these, helping to destigmatize these substances. Um, so I will move on quickly to Martin. Thank you for your patience, Martin, so much. Um, as I said earlier, Martin is uh, the, 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 the author of one of my favorite books, which is Being Human, uh, which is a fascinating book to read if you are engaging with this substance. Uh, Martin has many, many years experience, and I will let him tell you exactly uh, what it, how it goes. I... I just wanted to say I saw an update about your sleep problems uh, recently and uh, I'm sorry that you haven't made any progress, but we all wish you really uh, lots of luck with that and we hope that you find a solution. But Thank I'll you. leave it over to you, Martin, now. Okay. Well, um, first, I just want to say thank you for inviting me and having me in this event. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun to participate remotely for something that's happening in, in Amsterdam. I was there some years ago. I think it was maybe 2012. In the summer, I was in Amsterdam, and I have fond memories of munching on um, psilocybin truffles and boating around in the canals. So mm -hmm. I had a good time in Amsterdam. Um, yeah, I mean, I could talk about 5-MeO for hours and hours. That's actually kind of what I do for a living for, in large part. Um, <laughs> I've given so many interviews about it. Um, so I'll, I'll just say a few introductory things. Um, one is that I got involved and very interested in 5-MeO-DMT um, over a decade ago now. And at the time, when I first experienced 5-MeO-DMT, and it just completely blew me away in terms of what the experience was, at that time, so we're talking about um, around 2008, um, really the molecule that was all the rage at that time was DMT or quote unquote regular DMT. And very few people had ever heard of 5-MeO DMT. And when I would say things like 5-MeO DMT, people would say, oh, you mean DMT? I was like, no, I don't mean DMT. I mean 5-MeO, 5-methoxy DMT. And so there was very, very little knowledge about it at the time. And 
there was kind of a general opinion for those who did know something about it. Like there was a talk by Terrence McKenna where Terrence McKenna said, well, 5-MeO DMT, it's just this feeling. It's just this feeling. He said, but I really like NNDMT because that's when I really hallucinate. And he really emphasized the hallucinating on DMT. And so <laughs> ev everyone was like, yeah, DMT is like, that's, that's the shit. That's the bomb. And this 5-MeO it's stuff, it's, it's just a feeling. It's just a feeling. And my response to that is, but what is the nature of that feeling? I mean, what are we talking about here? Because for me, the, the comparison was just so far weighted on the side of 5-MeO DMT because my experience, my very first full experience of 5-MeO DMT was, holy shit, I just merged with God. I became one with all that is in all space and all time, eternity, infinite consciousness, infinite love, infinite presence, infinite awareness. And you people want to tell me that machine elves and aliens and UFOs, <laughs> like that's the top of the line? You got to be fucking kidding me. <laughs> so, and, and it was at that point where I coined the term the God molecule that I got on my podcast. This was early on when I had started my podcast, The Entheogenic Evolution. And I said, well, look, if people want to call DMT the spirit molecule, that's fine. But 5-MeO DMT, this is the God molecule, okay? And I definitely received, oh, man, I got so many messages, hate messages, hate, hate mail. People are like, what the fuck are you talking about? Who the hell do you think you are? I mean, there was, there was a lot of angry blowback because I became kind of a critic of Terrence McKenna of saying that, you know, this whole stuff about machine elves, it, this just seems like the sideshow at the carnival. But, you know, the, the, the real deal is the non-dual experience. And that's where I started really introducing the language of non-duality into the psychedelic community and also at that point in time really the way that i would characterize it is everybody was kind of operating from sort of a shamanic model of psychedelic experience and in my own experience and then you know my perception from my 5meo experience was that the dualistic model of self and other and self and spirit and me and this other realm and all that, that this is still the language of duality. And that for me, it was very clear that the non-dual experience was something that was beyond that. It was something that was more fundamental and that it's when you cross these different levels of perception and of experience that you, you then get a vantage point on where you were. So from the non-dual experience, suddenly it provides new insights into the nature of the dualistic experience that previously might just be filled with wonder and awe. But then from the, the non-dual vantage point, is like, oh, I now see this as manifestations of myself, manifestations of my own mind in some capacity, even though that can be transcendental and transcendent aspects of the self. It doesn't necessarily need to be a personal aspect of the self. But into the state of unity that you can be launched into through 5-MeO, that for me, that was just very clearly the heart of the experience of what it means to be a human being, which is, in, in my take, is we are God filtered down into the vehicle of a human being having a human experience. But our ultimate identity is the one unitary consciousness that is everyone and everything at all times and all places. And so you mentioned being human, that um, that was the first book I wrote after going through this process with 5-MeO-DMT of, of really coming to accept that. And, and I you know, would add that it wasn't an easy thing for me to accept because, of course, for anyone to say... I am God, that the ego is going to say, dude, you can't say that. Like, you know, that that is like, that's the most egotistical thing you could ever possibly say. But I just <laughs> yeah. coming, kept coming back to this truth. Like, well, shit, we are all God. I'm not, I'm not trying to say I'm God. So everybody bow down before me that that's total nonsense. It's that we are all God. We are all this one unitary consciousness that there is only one consciousness. And that is sort of functioning as an actor that is performing the different roles that we are all identified as, as individuals. But the consciousness itself is one, and it's unitary. So 
I felt at the time I felt compelled to write the book being human, that that was my understanding. It's like, look, to be human is to be God in a human body. And it doesn't mean that you are completely unlimited because of course in the human form we have our human limitations we have our human experience and there's nothing wrong with that but it, what i identified as a problem is the identification of anything lesser than that of saying well i am this i am that and then the divisions that that creates within humanity so that i really saw 5meo as a potential tool to introduce to humanity as a way to overcome our egoic identifications and limitations, the ways that we divide ourselves and separate ourselves and then decide that the other is wrong or needs to be conquered or needs to be killed or needs to be converted or whatever it may be, that all virtually all human conflict comes from our limited sense of identity. And I really felt that if more people could have the full non-dual experience, that that could help transform human society and that also it's something that I feel is deeply necessary at this point in time. I mean, I'm speaking to you from the United States of America where we have Ego Supreme in charge currently. <laughs> and we can see the, 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 the truly sick nature of what happens when ego runs rampant. And that's what's happening in the United States right now. And the only way to alleviate that symptom is to go beyond the ego. And that's where I see 5-MEO as a very rich and potent tool for helping individuals have that experience to then put their own limited sense of self into a more holistic and unified perspective to understand that we really are all one. That when I'm dealing with another person, yes, that's another person, that person has his or her own history, his or her own identity, sense of self, problems, hopes, dreams, whatever. But underneath it all, that's also myself over there. Every other person I ever talk to or ever encounter is another version of myself. And I don't mean the Martin self because that's the version of me over here. I mean the universal self that we all are and that when – we can, it's one thing to, to try and like understand that, but this comes from a place, to go back to that Terrence McKenna quote, that it's this feeling. If you can feel that and come from that place, from the feeling within the heart that I'm speaking to another version of myself right now and how I treat this other version of myself is a reflection of how I treat myself, that that has revolutionary potential for humanity. And so that's why ever since I had my experience and experiences in 2008 and going into 2009, that I just decided that, look, I want to tell everybody about 5-MEO DMT. I want to make this a major focus of my podcast. Pretty much it's the only thing I've written about since then, um, both nonfiction and I've written some novels that are pretty much exclusively about 5-MEO DMT. Um, I write music about 5-MEO DMT. I make art to try and reflect the experience of 5-MEO DMT and psychedelics in general. Um, I've given hundreds of interviews about 5-MeO DMT. I've told my story, you know, umpteen zillion times. Um, and people keep coming back to it because uh, there's more and more knowledge and awareness. I mean, like 10 years ago, again, when I first started talking about 5-MeO DMT and people were like, well, what are you talking about? There never would have been an event like this in Amsterdam. Um, but now the knowledge of 5-MeO has really exploded around the world. And kind of what we're dealing with now is people struggling to develop what are the proper methods and what are the proper screening techniques and what kind of preparation do we need? What kind of integration do we need afterwards? Um, when is it appropriate? What is the right context and setting? And who are you doing with it with? And what kind of impact does that have on your experience? And I myself, I've written my book uh, in Theogenic Liberation, which I wrote uh, after I stopped doing one-on-one -on -one sessions with people. For me, it was always very important to only work with people one-on-one. -on -one. 
with 5-MeO DMT and allow up to three hours for the entire session. Um, that I really don't like the whole drive-by approach that's going on out there where you people are doing one person after another after another, and then there's people moving around and people rattling around you or somebody's singing songs and other people coming up to you and trying to talk to you. And also, you know, making people stand like I don't even I don't that doesn't make any sense to me that people want to lie down. Uh, so there's lots of things that I see going on that I'm not particularly thrilled about. But I also think that people should be able to choose who they go to and what method they feel like they're comfortable with. But I took from doing seven years of one on one work with people, I distilled that down into my book in Theogenic Liberation. So that's my expression of what I think the best practices are and the potentials and the pitfalls and uh, kind of going back to what uh, Ollie said, I always want to emphasize that even people who have really positive experiences on 5-MeO can also have a great deal of difficulty afterwards integrating the experience. And I always like to emphasize for anyone who hasn't tried it, no matter what you think the experience is, just know you have no idea. Because <laughs> any, any idea that we have is by its very nature a dualistic concept of separating this from that, yes or no, right? All of our ideas exist in the realm of duality. Language in and of itself exists in the realm of duality because language implies that there is a speaker and a hearer, that there is more than one, right? So that all language, all conceptuality is within the realm of duality. And you cannot have an idea of what this experience is. And also for many people, because their ego, their, their normal sense of self has no point of reference for the full non-dual experience, it's also very common for people to essentially miss it where they're like, well, I remember smoking or vaporizing something, and then 15 minutes later, suddenly there I was again, and did I do, did something happen? Was, was I there? You know, and they don't even know. And then it comes filtering back through reactivations, through dreams, through meditations. So it's, you know, it's not for the casual tourist. It's not for someone who's just like, oh, I, I want to try it out just because I'm curious, that you have no point of reference for this. And so integrating that, and learning how to move through that with presence and awareness, that that's something that can take practice and it can take working at lower levels and higher levels and in different contexts and different settings. Um, but really the thing that I advise for anyone who's contemplating working with it is make sure to get to know the people who are gonna be serving it to you. And if, if you don't feel that you can put your life in this person's hands, then walk away. Because you are, and not necessarily in the literal sense, but certainly in the experiential sense that if you get a full dose of 5-MeO-DMT, you will think that you're dying. And it's a matter of whether you can say, I'm dying, yes, yes, <laughs> and go with it. But then the flip side of that is that for some people, it's like, oh my God, make it stop, please, no. And it becomes this incredibly traumatic experience. For people. So we're, we're dealing with something that is infinitely powerful and it should always be treated with care and treated with caution. And I don't know, I, I, I can ramble on forever. I mean, I can talk about this for as long as you want, but maybe, <laughs> maybe if there are questions, if you want to me direct too. me, if you want to direct <laughs> me in a certain direction, I'll go that direction. But I think I think we'll, we'll 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 start with some questions in a minute. But thank you, Martin, so much. That was, again, was fascinating uh, perspective there. Thank you very much. Um, I just just wanted to to let you know about the place we are in Amsterdam, and it, it's it'd be lovely to uh, to greet you in Amsterdam uh, again in the near future. And I hope that you can come over soon. That you, you'll ha you'll certainly have somewhere to stay at my place. No problem. So you. Uh, you know, maybe maybe we can entice you. Um, this place where we are, uh, Rauchord, is uh, it's roughly translated into rough place. Uh, it was originally a pirate island. Uh, it got joined to the mainland at, at some point, and uh, they built a village here, which was squatted in the 80s by a bunch of hippies and artists and uh, ne'er-do-wells and uh, creative people. 
Uh, and it's it's been here for a, a long time now. It's kind of I don't know if you're aware of Christiania in Denmark, but this is kind of the Dutch version of Christiania. So it's a, a, a hippie enclave <laughs> that's constantly under attack as well from the establishment, trying to clear it out. Um, but what I learned today, we were talking about McKenna. Um, Terence McKenna was here apparently in the in the 80s, so or the 90s. Was it 80s or 90s, Michael? Uh, in the late 80s. late 80s, Terence McKenna was here. So the spirit of, of McKenna is probably still here. And uh, it was, it's, I'm sure he's listening to us now with a big grin on his face. Um, so we'll, let, let's, let's move over to questions. Um, does anyone have any questions for anybody? Yeah. Camilla. Um, I, had a, I had a DMC experience, which involved like, maybe like four or five of us taking it at the same time. And I found it interesting because you said that you prefer doing it one-on-one -on -one. and I found that like the fact that we collectively went into this space changed the experience in a very kind of healing healing collective way would you think about like giving it to people all at the same time maybe you are I guess like experiencing at the same time but like I don't know maybe have some sort of collective healing happening because I feel like a lot we emphasize like individual healing but I think one thing that I found I found most that like that benefited myself mostly from the rave culture was the fact that by taking MDMA and going in a collective experience that healed that aspect which I can't do alone. I can do when other people are on drugs as well. Did, did you guys hear that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so who would like to? So so what what kind of experience did you have like uh, a DMT or a five meter DMT experience in the community? Uh, I'm not entirely sure which DMT it was. I think it was NDMT. <laughs> well, you, you will be sure if you answer a simple question: Was it a feeling or was it machine elves? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was it was a feeling, but I don't think it was five meo because I've gotten the I've gotten a similar feeling for five meo on N sometimes. Like I sometimes go into the Similar experience so with five meo and an MDMT is that really the dose matters. Like a dose of seven milligrams or six milligrams of uh, five meo MDMT can easily be, um, like you know, uh, mis misfelt for an MDMT experience and vice versa if an MDMT is so high enough. The thing, the thing that you have is definitely very beneficial because it's lovely to be together with other people people you know to you reunite with the oneness and everything this is what happening on, on ayahuasca sessions and all of this but what um i personally am talking about and i guess i know martin is talking about is an experience with just you dissolving into everything so becoming the oneness of all creation and and there um there is no one left who has then a judgment upon this was nice to be together so, so that's the point, you see, if you dissolve into the experience, become the experience, it's very beneficial if that happens in a one-on-one -on -one setting, because um, initially, you know, we are living in a dual world and one and one becomes one. And the power of no one judging, no one putting energy upon you. Like I've been doing sessions with one on two, like a couple being together in one room. We were free. One person was smoking the, uh, or vaping the 5-MEO. And the other person was sitting there having their worries, having their hopes, having their stuff. And all, all stuff and all things are energy or, uh, yeah, well, everything is energy. So they were sitting there and putting their stuff into the session of the other person. So even though they were caring for each other and it's all lovely and stuff and it's nice to see each other then and couple and stuff, yeah, you still have this interaction of energetical, um, of energetical stuff from different people towards one another. And so in these days, I, I put people in a different part of the house. So not even a different room, but a different part of the house. So there's no audio and, and nothing visual um, to exchange. And I even don't let them look at each other after the first session. So they are totally blank when they do their session. And that's really something for 5-MEO. If you have a full dose, it's very beneficial that you, that you do this for yourself. What you were describing is this super beautiful thing. I've been doing this on the weekends too, like giving DMT or giving small dosages of 5-MEO DMT. It, it brings the group together. So on the Fridays we had that. And so on the Saturdays, the group was getting together in a mushroom session then united from that Friday night. 
well, that's very beneficial. But if you have like full non-dual experience, this is something not for a group, if you ask me. I mean, I had a non-dual experience in a group and I found that coming back and talking about it together, sort of like lifting off together and coming back from that space together. I don't know, it, it seemed to be, it seemed like the integration was different, which I don't yeah. know, maybe isn't for everyone, but I thought it was, yeah. it was, it was a thing to, to put, I don't know, to put the emphasis well, on in, like, singularly or together yeah. with people. Well, well, let's see, the beauty is we are all free to have whatever we want. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I, I think if if I, if if I could make a, a an observation. So I think the largest five meo ceremony that I've ever done was with probably with um, thirty people simultaneously. Uh, with oh. th I think we had two or three people uh, dosing with the pipe. Uh, this was outdoors, uh, but this was also with a group of very experienced uh, magicians. So uh, these were people who had experienced like a wide variety of other altered states of consciousness induced through uh, chemistry and other kind of endogenous methods. I think that certainly in terms of limiting the variables that you've got in terms of the set and setting, working one on one or working on your own, if you're comfortable with the material, makes a lot of sense. But also is we're, we're, um, we're social creatures. And, and uh, we appear to be social creatures, which, uh, although we may be capable of attaining or realizing or uncovering these uh, non-dual states, we're still a social animal being ex expressed into the physical realm through that. And so having people around you, people having a sangha, having a community, whether that's physically present in the ritual because these people are, you know, uh, you're bonded, there's some kind of collective thing, or whether or not they're people that you can go to after the experience and say, hey, it was like it, this, this is how it was. What both Ollie and Martin have been saying about the importance of integration, particularly for 5-MEO, because very often what happens in my experience has been mentioned before, is that with people when they perhaps wake up from their next, uh, the sleep after they have after 5-MEO, they may have that experience of coming back into their bodies from the dream state, from the sleep state, and waking up with this kind of, oh, what, what Martin so elegantly demonstrated by kind of moving backwards, you know, that kind of sense of coming back into the body can happen. And so whether you have that community of practice to speak to immediately after that in the environment, or whether or not that's people you can communicate with online or other friends you can have to kind of smooth the way back into the integration, that really matters. But a lot of it, I think, is also down to uh, the way the session is curated, the dosage level, all of those variables. And as Ollie's saying, you know, we've got this range of different op uh, opportunities available to many people, um, although still within the context in many places of uh, prohibition and oppression. Um, and uh, I think, as Martin said, you know, ultimately it comes down to the people you're working with, the people you're doing this medicine with, to call it that. Do you trust them? Do you <laughs> trust them ideally with your life? Yeah? And if it's a good group of close friends who want to do this and you want to sit there and you want to curate the space so that one person goes through the experience, they, they're held in that, then perhaps you're waiting some time, then the next person goes through. I've seen that used as an effective model. Um, so I think, you know, your mileage may vary, as I believe they say in America. Um, but and there are lots of different ways of, uh, of, of using this particular medicine. Yeah, and I would just jump in to give a quick answer to that. Um, for myself, the way that I worked with people was always one-on-one -on -one because I would always take the medicine with my clients and we would do up to three rounds of medicine um, over the course of two to three hours. And within that, my attention was focused 100% on the client and helping them to move through the energy of the experience and give them coaching and also responsive energy work as it was needed. And that is something that just there's no practical way of doing that with more than one person at a time. So that was my model for how I worked with people. Um, when I went to the World Bufo Alvarez Congress uh, a couple summers ago in Mexico City to sort of open that up, we did a group launch with like 50 people all at once. And so that was my largest experience of like being with many other people on 5MEO at the same time. And, um, you know, I could say that was fun. It was interesting. It didn't anywhere near have the kind of impact of like doing direct one-on-one -on -one work in my own experience. But I do think that there's a variety of models that people can use. And I think one of the values 
um, of doing any kind of group work it is that it extends beyond that is that especially with 5-MeO DMT having people you can talk to about it is very very valuable and having people who have had the experience themselves I mean what I do right now is I don't hold medicine sessions with people anymore, but I do Skype consultations with people around the world, helping them integrate their 5-MeO experience. And most of the time, I'm talking to people who don't have anybody else to talk to. And so there's a big value when you can say to someone, wow, I just had this experience. And they say, oh, I can relate to you. And like, and like something I've written about and I've talked about is that like, if you're in a romantic partnership, it's it becomes really difficult. Like if one half of the partnership has the experience and the other half doesn't, because then how do they relate to each other after that point? So just having a community where you can discuss and integrate, that can be very valuable. But I think that the deepest work is done at a, at an individual level. And also I would say that, you know, I spent about a year and a half going to the Santo Daime church here. Oh, we've lost, we've lost, Martin, we've lost you, but we did well so far. It, it's uh, Mercury, Mercury is retrograde, and I think we've done very well to make it this far. Are there any I've, other questions, perhaps? Are you, are you coming back? I think we have to yeah, I think, I think we're, we're at the end anyway, but is there, uh, has anyone else got any questions directed at one of our panelists? Yes, please stand stand up and shout if you can. Hello, thank you guys. Uh, I just want to ask uh, around the preparation for like the therapy experience, like how do you prepare this for that, like in terms of diet or like psychological and spiritual preparations and also like how do you navigate the experience? Do you surrender, like, and how do you overcome fear if it arises? Thank you. Um, may, may I answer first? or <laughs> Because that's the typical question I've been getting from my clients and possible clients and former clients and next clients. And it's a typical question. So first of all, you can't prepare for the unknown. It's, that's, it's imp impossible because you have no idea what's coming towards you. That's the first thing. Second thing is letting go is not a doing. Letting go is a state of, I don't give a shit. Like, I don't care. It's a, pure, it's a pure state of, I don't care. Nothing matters. See, and that's a beautiful language also. Matter, you know, matter. Yeah, nothing matters. And that's the point. No thing is real. It's all one. It's all energy. And therefore, it doesn't really matter what is. If you try to let go, you find yourself in the state of, I want to let go, I want to let go. And that's the very, the very thing which keeps you from letting go is thinking you need to let go. You need to do something to get somewhere else. Being is doing in the moment without a cause. It's just being. It's just, you know, so letting go is a state of, I'm okay. I don't care. I don't mind. And then it's happening. So physically and psychologically prepare, preparation for a session is something which I also don't see and where I would say people just live your life. Being, being obsessed with the idea that two weeks in two weeks you will do the session will keep you from the present moment away and the present moment is all there is always, ever. So thinking about the future is the worst thing you can do in, in the sense of like being now, here, now. So what I tell people is be human, embrace yourself, have some nice things for yourself, enjoy being human, take care for your little child inside, have a good time up to the session, make the trip to me here, to come here, a, a trip overall, like and embrace it. Book some extra days here, have some sightseeing before and after, just make it, make it a gift to yourself, make it a treasure, make it a, a pleasure, make it a joy. And this is what I tell people to prepare. Nothing in regards to what is typically found in uh, shamanic circles, like um, lowering, lowering the power of the ego, putting the ego in place, you know, all these things, these things where I believe is the ego behind. So I personally am always for be human, you know, enjoy your humanness. Embrace your human beingness. 
and and therefore you know you can't prepare anyway so why would you yeah thank you thank you Oli. um julian do you have anything to add I, I would say in terms of general preparation for any psychedelic experience having a bit of a having a practice of meditation having a practice of uh, body work or body activity so keeping keeping the uh um the foundation that you want to bring into these experiences in in good order eat well rest well don't bother absorbing vast quantities of pointless news content which is only a list of distressing things to be concerned about with very little possibility perhaps of you influencing them directly um for me like uh, my practice is is uh, uh, things like tai chi yoga free form movement to kind of work with the body and be present in that uh, and then to do open monitoring or mindfulness type meditation or concentration meditation to keep those things working well and that's just like an ongoing practice for me for for being being human for being here in the world uh, and then to bring those things forward into uh, into the session so you've prepared a good kind of foundation for for your life just as a person um i i, I take the point that what ali's saying about people people get very kind of fixated on this thing but nevertheless this is also a powerful experience and and so i i just tell people if they're going to go into a session be really gentle with yourself you know take it easy do your body work do your practice eat well get good rest be kind to yourself you know be be uh, uh, um allow yourself to enter the process which can be uh, a really powerful um, strange attractor in your own future uh, but it may well be that you know to meet that as has already been said that we know that the uh, uh, the process of letting go of of, of, of um, uh, allowing the experience to kind of come through us is really what we want and so to kind of if you like cleanse the channel whether we see it as shamanic or a neurohack or whatever just that process of being involved in uh, meditative practice in some kind of physical practice spending time in nature all of those things that we know are good for us we should try and cultivate those things all the time and then when we decide to sign up to go and sit with someone or to go to whatever the experience is we can feel that we've yeah we're coming from broadly speaking a good place we can always turn up the notch on that a little bit if that gives us a sense of agency in those things but fundamentally we don't know what's going to happen so we just have to be kind of kind to ourselves and approach those experiences with curiosity, um, a little bit of trepidation, of course, because we're humans and uh, to, to, to face something that is the unknown, that we've been told is tremendously powerful. Of course, we're going to get um, perhaps anxiety about that, but then to reframe that as excitement and curiosity and to enter that in a very kind of open hearted way, uh, but from a good perspective and a good position with looking after our bodies and looking after our minds and being again to go back to the earlier point in the community so that we know that when we've had that experience we can go back we can bring it to people who will understand us you know whether you're talking online to someone like martin or or, or you know uh, other people you're able to process that material so you've got like not just the preparation but a bit of an, the outro you figured a little bit about that as well yeah that's important Fantastic. Thank you, Julian. I'll just update Martin. Martin, unfortunately, we lost you mid-conversation yeah. there. Um, I think we've done very well so far, considering Mercury is retrograde and uh, we have had minimal uh, technological interruption. Uh, I'm amazed that this is working at all, actually. Um, the question was, uh, what is the best preparation for the 5-MEO experience? So if you, this is our last question. If you, if you can answer that, then we'll say goodnight to you all. All right. Well, I definitely recommend my book, Entheogenic Liberation. It's one of the reasons why I wrote it. Was to prepare people. For and my other book. book. And my other book. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, hey, Martin, you know, look. just, just c coming from a place of having lots of experience with it, that within the book, Entheogenic Liberation, I really tried to lay out like these are all the different ways that people energetically enter into the experience, where they encounter difficulty how they integrate, where people avoid, where people hold on. But beyond that, you know, one of the universal bits of advice that I give to people is practiced honesty within yourself, both internally and externally. And the reason for that is because, again, this, this is my interpretation. I think it's correct that 
<laughs> 5MEO reveals the ultimate truth of human identity, that we are God. So it's this experience of truth. It's this feeling, this direct knowing of truth. And so the more we can practice authentic honesty within ourselves, in our daily life, the ways that we think within our own mind, the way that we express ourselves to others, then the, the easier it will be for us to encounter the full truth and honesty of our being. And so it's a really simple thing. Don't say things you don't mean. Tell people what you really think. Express what you really feel. And that then when you have this event of, oh my God, it's God, that you can relax and move into that. But if you're someone who's constantly spewing bullshit or trying to be something for somebody else or for other people or for your job or for your family or for your lover or your partner, if you're constantly masking yourself, then this is going to be much more radical because that mask is going to get stripped away. But if you have been practicing, to go back to the language we're using here, of just being human and being yourself from an honest and authentic place, that will make it easier for you to let go and to trust because it won't be, oh my God, I've just been mired in bullshit and now here's this infinite <laughs> expanse of truth. It's, okay, I know this feeling because I've been practicing being authentic and being honest. And that's just at a very practical level. There's a lot more that people can do, but I think that that's one of the deepest things is practice authentic honesty with yourself both internally and externally. And that's what's going to help you the most. Perfect. Thank you, my lovely way to it. To... Lovely way to round off. Thank you so much, Martin. It's uh, been amazing to talk to you. Also, thank you, Julian and Ollie and Malin, who dropped off the call earlier. Uh, we are going to do some wonderful research here in the next couple of weekends on this amazing substance. Um, and uh, thank you for being part of this. Thank you, Plant Medicine Day. We yeah. appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, all of you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Plant Medicine. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, guys, see ya. See you later. Thanks so much. Ciao. Ciao. See you, Ollie. Ciao. See you, Julian.